with the rest of the afternoon. The meeting's being recorded, as we've all just been told. Well, welcome. Today, I had it in the schedule as oral pathology and oral radiology. But as you will see, the real name for this lecture is the best things in life include this oral pathology lecture. So get ready for something that you are really going to enjoy. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ken Tilashowski. We call him Dr. T, so you'll see that on there. And he is an oral pathologist by training and an endodontist. So he's got lots of pictures of some really, really interesting cases to show you. This is one of the favorite lectures of our dental students. And for those of you who are in the other disciplines, you are gonna enjoy this as well as this truly crosses all the disciplines. So I don't wanna take any more of his time. Uh, Dr. T and your bow tie, let's go, we're ready. All right, great. We're coming. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, Ken Tilshowski, everybody calls me Dr. T because nobody wants to say Tilshowski. My email's on there. I am fine with emails. Whether you want to email me just saying, you know, if you got a question, whether it's today or in two weeks or in two years, I am always, always happy for um, contact, especially now that we're kind of isolating. The contact's even more important. Um, if I ever, if you send an email and I don't reply like within a day, just send it again. It's nothing personal. Just sometimes my email box gets so full that I, um, get behind and once I get behind it's like you never catch up. So I'm excited to spend a little time with you today. Um, we can use the uh, chat function if you have any questions. I'll be stopping along the way to answer any questions and we'll make sure to say a few times at the end. So welcome to SHEPEP. I actually really don't know what that acronym stands for because I, I don't want, I want that to be a mystery of life because we always call this the summer program which is great. Um, and I do want to thank you for taking the time and being with us today. And not that I'm into pandas, but I just got a puppy and he's like the most adorable thing in the world. It's a Malta poo. So half Maltese, half toy poodle. And I have four kids and I've spent my career like showing pictures of my kids. And now it's, I'm, I've transitioned to um, puppy pictures. And the only time you'll see a picture of my kid going forward, I think is when actually my kids with the puppy. Okay. So yeah, he's, he's just been a great dog. So we've had him for uh, just over a month. So let's start by just looking at some amazing stuff, okay? Here's the ugliest patient I ever saw. And yes, it's a dog, okay? You can see that big old canine tooth, but dogs get pathology too. There are actually veterinary pathologists, not my specialty, okay? This is my friend's dog, Zoe. Um, um, this is actually Tyler Prentice, one of our graduates who's an orthodontist in the Chattanooga area. His, his dog, Zoe, also has what's called macroglossia which is an abnormally large tongue. Um, this is Zoe at rest. You always see with Zoe when she's heated, that tongue's almost on the ground. So this is what we call a calculus bridge. This is just somebody that's had really poor hygiene over a long extended period. This is like the biggest calculus bridge I ever saw. It actually extends not just across the front teeth, but all the way back into some of the posterior teeth. And we call it a bridge because it bridges all the way across. Usually when we see something like this, um, the patients usually aren't quite with it mentally. This is something you might see on somebody that has some mental deficits because, you know, if you've got a good, good intellect, it's, it's usually you're not going to let something grow this big before even treating or, or you're going to brush better than this. But uh, this patient actually seemed um, to have a normal intellect on, on an interview. We actually ended up leaving this because it was the only thing holding the anterior teeth in. The, the front six teeth were totally held in by this because there, there was no bone around those teeth. Um, if we remove this calculus, the teeth were going to go too. And she said she'd keep it for now. What was really remarkable is this looks just like the Nile River Delta. This is not a Photoshop document. This actually is what the Nile River Delta looks like from a, 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 a really high elevation. It is pouring here. I don't know if you can hear my rain, but um, it is pouring. Um, this patient and this patient came into the dental school in the same week. Okay, not to see me as a pathologist, but just into our emergency clinic and said, I have a hole in the roof of my mouth. Now, I want you to see this, that this is a hole that you can actually see up into the nasal cavity. So I want you to just think to yourself for a second, what sort of things would you think about if you saw this? Okay, Do you, I mean, and, and I'll throw out just a couple, just, just things to get you, you, you thinking is, are you thinking anything good? Probably not, right? Actually, the most common cause of this and the most common reason to see this is actually from drug abuse and specifically cocaine. Um, cocaine is an interesting drug 
that really dentally, it doesn't have a lot of implications except, okay? We certainly don't wanna see a patient that's on cocaine while we're doing dental work because we use epinephrine in our anesthetics that help keep the, make the anesthetic last longer. And if somebody's on a stimulant, whether it's cocaine or methamphetamine, we certainly don't wanna add a stimulant like epinephrine to that because it can have some cardiac um, um, interactions. But as long, cocaine actually is metabolized pretty quickly, it gets out of the system within a day or two. And so the general rule is 24 hours after cocaine use, it's okay to see a patient for dental treatment. But cocaine is an anesthetic with a built-in vasoconstrictor. And if you ever see on TV somebody taking cocaine and like rubbing it on their gingiva, it's not getting them high, it actually numbs the gingiva. It's a great topical anesthetic and it has really lots of medical uses but it's got such an abuse potential, we can't use it in medicine because you know, people would steal it. Um, it does have a medical, some medical uses and there are, are ENTs that use it because it's such a good topical anesthetic. But it has this built-in powerful vasoconstrictor. What does that mean? It constricts the blood vessels. And it's not unusual for somebody um, to have perforation of the nasal septum from using cocaine because it constricts the blood vessels and they get what's called ischemic necrosis. It's, it's death of the tissue from a lack of blood supply. And this patient used cocaine on the weekends over a nine year period, it was her history. And you can imagine this powerful vasoconstrictor sitting on the floor of the nasal cavity and causing necrosis and through the bone, ultimately into the oral cavity. Relatively easy fix for us. We can make an obturator, to, which is like a denture that plugs the hole or even potentially a soft tissue closure if they quit using cocaine. The other big deal with cocaine, and just to think about medical implications as we talk about just even, even systemic diseases, is if anybody's ever been an IV drug user, there's a really high chance they've had um, bacterial infection on their heart. And so anybody that's been an IV drug user, we have to be, take consideration of potentially given antibiotics before a dental appointment to prevent reinfection of a heart valve. So just lots of, lots of interesting tie-ins. This patient, like I said, was a second patient, came in the same week, um, denied, denied, denied cocaine use. And you know, after asking it 20 times, um, I kind of believed it. And we, again, there's like, we don't think about good things. Now, oral cancers of the hard palate are not very common in the United States. Um, not to say they can't happen, they can, but they, it's not real common. And actually, if you look at the edge of this, it's actually pretty clean. It doesn't look like it's cancerous, but it turned out this patient had a cancer of their um, maxillary sinus that perforated or went into the oral cavity. So again, we have to be kind of a CSI detectives trying to figure out what, what somebody's got and why they've got something going on. So this was an interesting patient that um, it made his own obturator, meaning this plug for his cocaine palatal ulcer. <laughs> Um, and there, there his op, is his obturator. And it looks kind of ratty because he'd been using denture adhesive to hold this in, but just another manifestation. He also presented with what we call bruxism. He habitually grind his, grinded, ground his teeth because he's on the stimulant. Cocaine's is like really big stimulant. And I, I think he was on cocaine when he was in the chair because he was going a mile a minute. You can imagine he just wore his teeth down prematurely. And again, for us, the big deal is to find out if they've been an IV drug user and to make sure we don't see them while they're on the drug. This is a way more common presentation of cancer for us in the United States. Now, let me orient you here a little bit. This is the side of the tongue, okay? So, there, so if you look at your left side, there's a piece of gauze there that we're drawing the tongue out and there's this white area. So this is kind of the side bottom of the, bottom of the tongue. The white area is ominous, but what's even more ominous is the central area of ulceration, which didn't hurt, okay? Ulcer should hurt. If you got an ulcer in your mouth, it should hurt. The other thing, a big red flag for us is if an ulcer is there for a long time, that would be something we would have to consider that maybe this is something more ominous than a traumatic ulcer or a canker sore. Um, so again, CSI, figuring out if somebody has cancer, ultimately we end up with a biopsy to, to verify. But we also have to decide when a biopsy is needed and when a biopsy is not needed. And so we take a lot of things in consideration. We have to get a patient history. Um, certainly it's more ominous if they've been a smoker and a drinker. Um, we look at the site, we look at the clinical presentation and make a decision. Is this something we have to 
go in surgically and take a piece of it to figure out what's going on, or is this something that's less ominous and we may do some other treatment? Another presentation of cancer in the United States on the side of the tongue. Side of the tongue is a high risk side. And I, I think all of us would look at this, even if you weren't medically trained and say, that ain't right. You know, let's, let's um, think about doing something to that. Another common presentation, floor of the mouth. Now, if you think about it, if you've ever been to your physician is, you know, often, often not the same sort of oral exam you would get from a dental office. So the high risk sites for cancer for us, posterior, the back of the side of the tongue and floor of the mouth. Those are two places that we have to very purposely look. You're not going to see the floor of your mouth unless you actually try to look there. And that's part of what we do. That's just something we do with all new patients and then periodically. So this is something that should be done every time you go to the dentist for like getting your teeth cleaned. And so we have this area of ulceration and there's mass associated with this and this thick white area. So a floor of the mouth cancer. This was an interesting patient because at first glance, this looks terrible. Side of the tongue, which is a high risk site, it had been there for about two months, high risk presentation, you know, a non-healing ulcer is a real red flag for us. And even if you look at it clinically, it looks bad. But this patient gave a history and this is exactly what they said is I have a tooth that's poking me like a saber. And I don't know if you can see that saber tooth. He had a really sharp cuss tip. Now, if you had an area and whether it's on your hand or in your mouth and let's say, say you took a pin and just kept jabbing it every day, you're going to have an ulcer that doesn't heal. And so, you know, what would we tell that person that's jabbing their hand with a pin? We'd say, quit doing it, right? So for us dentally, we smoothed that cuss tip. But here's a really important thing is we got the patient back in two weeks to evaluate whether it's healing or not. Because the second thing, if, if we were wrong, the next thing in our, in our different, we call it a differential diagnosis, a list of possibilities what this could be. The next thing we were thinking about is cancer. So there are times we see a patient and say, you know, I'm not really sure what that is, but I don't think it's bad. Let's just make a note of it and we'll check you on your next, you know, on your six month recall. Other times we see something like this and say, well, I think that's traumatic ulcer. Let's smooth that off, but let's get you back in two weeks and make sure that's healing. Because if it wasn't healing in two weeks, we would take a biopsy. Now, somebody asked, um, why are those high risk areas? The, the, the tissues of your hard palate and the gingiva, the tissue right next to your gums is actually keratinized like your skin. It's got a layer of keratin on it, which is way more immune to carcinogens than the non-keratinized tissues in the oral cavity. So if somebody's a smoker and they bathe their entire mouth with smoke, it's those high risk non-keratinized sites that are, that are just are scary sites. Um, so if I asked you where in, the where in your mouth would you not want me to jab you with a pin, those are all the high risk sites. So floor of the mouth, side of the tongue, your soft palate, you know, your throat, those are all spots. And, and not that anybody wants me to jab a pin on the roof of their mouth, but I'd take that before my floor of the mouth. And somebody asked, what is the definition of an ulcer? It is just a break in the covering. And whether it's on your skin or in your mouth, you can have an ulcer on your, on your skin. It's just, you know, let's say you wrecked your bike and you skinned up your knee. If it's bleeding, that's an area of ulceration because you no longer have a skin covering on it. So anywhere that, anywhere that covering tissue is gone. And so you have exposed connective tissue. Now our bodies are little miracle machines and and ulcers just don't bleed and bleed and bleed because our, our uh, coagulation, the coagulation cascade kicks in and it actually creates something called fibrin. And it's covered often with, and here's a great example of an ulcer, this, that it's covered by this white or gray, we sometimes call it a pseudo membrane or just a membrane. And that's why ulcers just don't bleed and bleed and bleed. They're actually covered with what's called fibrin. And if somebody has a coagulation disorder, um, you know, von Willebrand's disease or hemophilia, there's alterations in that coagulation um, cascade that makes things bleed longer. Or if somebody's on an anticoagulant like Coumadin, and you may have a relative that's on that bleeds really easy, and it could be that they're on an anticoagulant like Coumadin. So this is something called an anthus ulcer, super, super common. We see this in about one in five patients. So this is something we treat all the time in dentistry 
because some patients are really bothered by this. You know, I get, I get aphthous ulcers, but I get, you know, mine never get bigger than about three millimeters and I get two a year where there's some people that live with eight of these that are the size of a dime continuously. And so there's all sorts of ways we have to, we can treat those patients, but we also have to rule out some systemic disorders that can present with ulcers that look like in them like that in the mouth, including things like ulcerative colitis would be an example of one that we have to, again, be a little bit of a detective, make sure we're treating the right condition and we're not treating something that actually needs a different treatment. This patient, does this, I'll ask, does this patient look sick to you? Yeah, he does. He's got a viral illness and this is super common. The first time you get herpes, herpes simplex virus, um, you can get flu-like symptoms and that's really true with any, any viral disorder you can present with flu-like symptoms, whether it's COVID or influenza or hepatitis B or herpes or HIV, you can present with flu-like symptoms. So fever, malaise, you don't feel good. Um, lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph node, um, malaise, I don't know, may have already said that. And then with herpes, kind of interesting, your mouth can be absolutely just tore up. Now, this is, for us in dentistry, this is purely a clinical diagnosis. We diagnose this based on presenting symptoms and then counsel the patient and often a parent, because this often occurs in a kid. If, if the dentist that see lots of kids, like pediatric dentists or, or any office that see lots, sees lots of kids, sees, will see this a lot. And we counsel them accordingly, sometimes prescribing an antiviral, but not all the time, sometimes. Just another example, we call this primary HSV or primary herpes, the first time you get it. Um, somebody asked what form of herpes are we seeing here? And that's a great question. There are actually eight members of the herpes family. And what we're seeing here is the first member of the family. It's called human herpes virus one, also known as herpes simplex virus one. Herpes simplex virus two is the second member of the family causes genital herpes. And then we see some other members, and I'm actually going to see you a, a I show you a, a, another case of a different type of herpes virus. Um, and then somebody asked, how did the child contract it? Well, if you're exposed to herpes, like with somebody with a fever blister, so a fever blister, which, which we're seeing here is a vesicle, it's, it's a small blister, a vesicle is a small blister on the lip that is teeming with herpes. This is reactivation of the herpes virus. Once you get a herpes virus, it stays in your system for life. Doesn't mean it's causing a problem, but you have it forever, okay? And so if you get herpes simplex virus one, you may get fever blisters, but not everybody that, gets, that has herpes simplex virus one gets fever blisters. In fact, if we look at the United States, about two thirds of the population has herpes simplex virus one, but only about a third of the population gets fever blisters. So if you kiss somebody with a fever blister, you might contract the virus, okay? Um, we can also see virus in saliva even when there's not an active fever blister. So we, we think that there's probably some cases are transmitted just from virus in saliva even when there isn't a fever blister. And herpes simplex virus one can also present in the mouth. And one of the thing a dentist have to has to decide is what caused this? This is different than a canker sore based on location and presentation. So we can look at the way diseases present and decide is it herpes, which is a virus, or is it an aphthous, which is not viral? Um, so somebody asked, what well, if the blister isn't visible, can it still be contagious? Well, technically any blister would be, you know, it's a, a blister means it's a blister. I mean, and technically any blister would be visible, but yes, it is potential to, there is a potential to pick up herpes even when there is not a blister, when there is not a vesicle, because there is asymptomatic shedding of virus in saliva. So if we test somebody with a history of fever blisters, test their saliva, sometimes we can find virus in the saliva even when there isn't a cold sore or a fever blister or lesions intraorally. So this is a really easy virus to get, and that's why two-thirds of Americans have it. If you go into other areas of the world where hygiene is a little different, people may live in more crowded conditions, everybody has it, okay? In the United States, it's not quite that ubiquitous, um, 
but there's a good chance that even if you don't get a fever blister, you have the virus because two thirds of Americans have the virus. Here's another disease called, um, call, we call this herpangina, but it's caused by a different type of virus. It's called by a Coxsackie virus. And if you've ever heard of herpangina, this is one of those viruses that typically hit like a daycare and absolutely just run through a daycare. Um, and, and often, you know, everybody gets sick from it. It's very contagious, but once you have it, you're not bothered by it again ever in life. So different than herpes, this one you get and it goes away, kind of like the flu, kind of like COVID, it goes away. But herpes, once you have it, it actually stays in your body forever and can be reactivated later in life. Um, another Coxsackie virus can cause something called hand, foot, and mouth disease. There's uh, lesions on the hands and feet that you can see, but also you can see lesions in the mouth. And not all patients have the full expression. They may just have lesions in their mouth. They may have lesions on their feet in their mouth, or they may have all three. And this was actually a third-year dental student. Um, and you think, and, and, you know, working in an academic health center, we see people that have been kind of isolated in their life that get exposed to diseases now that they're out and about. And this isn't a bad one to get exposed to. The chances are you've probably had hand, foot, and mouth disease, even if your parents don't remember you having it or you d don't remember having it because we pick up viruses all the time and we might get a little sick. We might get real sick and we get over them. This is my son who has a different herpes virus. And so this, this is not the normal presentation and I'll show you his face and it might give you a better idea what he had. He had chicken pox and chicken pox is actually a herpes virus. And he had classic skin lesions, but he also had lesions in his mouth. Now, this is a good example of how you have the virus forever. So if you have chicken pox, if you've had chicken pox, or you had the chicken pox vaccine, because a chicken pox vaccine is actually a live vaccine. If you get vaccinated for chicken pox, which most of you probably did be based on your age, um, they are actually giving you chicken pox. Now, the vaccine is called an attenuated vaccine it's kind of a not down version of the chickenpox vaccine. So even though they're giving you chickenpox, you don't get real sick from the vaccine. Not as sick as if you got chickenpox the old fashioned way. And once you have chickenpox or had the vaccine, then you're prone to shingles later in life because the virus can be reactivated. And this is my son when he was, oh boy, he was probably six when he had chickenpox and here he had shingles when he was 18. And that's a little unusual. Usually shingles gets reactivated later, later in life, but um, that is reactivation of those virus that stay in dormant. You know, it's in your body. It may not be causing any problems, but it can be reactivated later in life. And about a third of Americans will get shingles in their lifetime. And it's pretty exciting that we have a vaccine for chickenpox. We also have a vaccine for shingles that's approved for if you're 50 or older because it's usually later in life you get shingles. So we have vaccines can, that can present the worst manifestations of these diseases, which is great. So somebody asked what can reactivate a virus like that. And um, I don't know if you can see me, I'm gonna give you a kind of a visual here. So it's interesting, if you get chicken pox, you mount an immune system response to it, okay? Or if you have the vaccine, you get a really good immune system response. So you've got a good immune system response. But what happens over time is your immune response starts going down you get 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. And it's been so long since you got the primary disease, you just don't have as, as many memory lymphocytes to the virus. And at some point you might get 70 and get debilitated and the virus reactivates as shingles. And then your immune system response starts dropping and then you die of heart disease or cancer. So in general, people get shingles once. Now my son Carter's a little different that he got reactivation at 18, which is a little unusual. But this is reactivation. If we look at those lesions on his, his trunk, those are full of virus. And so if he got around a newborn, he could give the newborn chicken pox. Even though he has shingles, it's the, it's the reactivation of the chicken pox virus. So um, interesting how this all ties in. And chicken pox, um, shingles can occur in the mouth and can actually present with a toothache. And that's one of those things as a dentist, you have to be on a lookout for that is, if, if somebody presents with a toothache, but it doesn't make sense, you got to think, well, maybe this could be, this could be early manifestation of shingles. So interesting how the body and the mouth and everything ties in. 
Um, somebody said they had chickenpox twice as a kid. There's a chance that the vaccine didn't work on you and then you got chickenpox the old fashioned way. I mean, that's a chance, but, but once you have chickenpox, most people get a good immune system response to it, um, but that's a possibility. So we see, you know, I'm, I'm a lumper and, and we, we teach about how to recognize diseases and one way, and we've kind of looked at a bunch of ulcers. That was just one, one thing I wanted to give just some examples of is kind of one topic. Um, we could have picked different, you know, we could have picked lumps and bumps or other, a different topic, but we've looked at a lot of ulcers. We can, you know, I'm a lumper and I think about, um, I think about ulcers being either short duration, okay, they're, they're there for a week or so and heal, or longer duration. And so if we kind of lump these together, some people get canker sores from trauma. And that's me. That's my, that's, that induces canker sores for me or aphthous ulcers. So um, you can have a traumatic ulcer that, you know, you bite the inside of your cheek, you get an ulcer and it heals in a few days. Burns and allergic, re allergic reactions can also all, all cause ulcers. Aphthous can be triggered from other things. So I put, also put it in this miscellaneous category, but there's all sorts of other cool ulcers we see. And I say cool, they're cool, you know, they're cool to me. I'm a pathologist, but they're not cool for the patient. Erythema multiforme is an unusual immune system response to something. It might be a food, it might be a drug. And it's important for us to recognize it because the patient needs to be treated with a high dose steroid pretty quick, or it can turn into some bad things. Necrotizing salometaplasia, big old word that means a, a minor salivary gland in the hard palate, a little gland in the hard palate gets necrotic and presents as an ulcer. And then all these infectious ones, a lot of the short-term ulcers we see are caused by viruses. You know, somebody gets a virus, they're sick for a few days a week, it goes away and it's gone. So um, I got a question here is how high is the risk of these various pathologies to the clinician? Re great question. And, and we certainly think about that right now with COVID, right? As we're going back to dental work and we've got patients with COVID, remarkably pretty low. Why? because we do proper infection control, okay? We disinfect our laboratory, we sterilize our instruments, we wear proper PPE, we focus on hand washing. Um, and so it's all about being smart with the patients you're around. Um, I am a complete germaphobe and I can be a dentist, okay? Um, which really fits my personality because dentists are very, cautious about what we do. And, and that's part of what we have to do is not cross contaminate things. You know, if, if somebody's saliva, you know, you're aerosolizing things in the operatory, you have to go in and disinfect afterwards. So, so remarkably low risk for us. If we think about long-term ulcers, we looked at cancer. That's my, that's my acronym for squamous cell carcinoma, which is the, it was the most common oral cancer. Um, other cancers can present with an ulcer that doesn't heal. We saw that cocaine ulcer in the hard palate, and we saw that saber ulcer on the side of the tongue. So even traumatic ulcers can be long-term. And then there's some really funky ones out there that if um, there's some weird fungal infections that generally occur only if you have a poor immune system. So most of us aren't really prone to these, but um, you'll even see advertisements on TV for some of the, these immune modulating drugs for things like um, psoriasis and some other conditions that they say at the end of it and certain fungal infections if you live in um, certain areas. And they're talking about these weird fungal infections that these drugs make you more prone to get them. So again, it's important for us to be able to recognize, is this cancer? Is this potentially a fungal infection? And do we get a biopsy to figure out what this is going on? Or do we do something else to treat it? And then there's a whole slew of actually autoimmune conditions that occur predominantly in the mouth. So autoimmune means your immune system is attacking itself. So things like lupus, you may have heard of lupus um, is an autoimmune condition, but we have some different autoimmune conditions like lichen planus that can be just in the mouth with no other manifestations. It's important for us to recognize it because these are conditions now we treat with a steroid to suppress the immune system locally. So just lots of interesting things we see. Um, these are, I just wanted to share that these are differential diagnosis charts that we work with our students with too, as we um, do case studies and say, okay, if somebody's got a short ulcer, short duration ulcer versus long duration ulcer, and we've 
we, we, these are all things they know in detail, way more detail that's on here. But then we, we go through scenarios and say, okay, here, here's what this patient presents with. What do you think? You know, what would you do? What's the next step? What's the proper treatment? So um, lots of scenarios to make sure that when they get in practice, they're ready to um, um, treat these things in practice. So I'm going to ask another question. These are questions are great. The timing are coming great. Um, somebody asked if a mother carries herpes, will all of her children have it at the time they were born? No, not necessarily. Now that's kind of a, I'm going to add a little detail to that. So it's very, it, you, you certainly, a mother could have herpes and nobody else in her family does. Okay. Um, my wife had this weird eye thing going on and they did a million dollar work up on her a couple of years ago. And one of the things that we're looking for was, um, one of the things they checked for her was, was herpes and she has antibodies to it. She has herpes, but she's never had a fever blister. Um, I'm negative for herpes. So even though she has the virus, I don't, and I've been with her for 35 years. So even somebody that is in very close contact may not. Now, if a mother had genital herpes and had active lesions and a baby was born vaginally, there would be high risk so that a newborn would pick up herpes during birthing, but that would be a reason for the OBGYN to do a C-section. They generally wouldn't do a vaginal delivery if somebody had active genital herpes. So um, these are things we have to think about um, because herpes in a newborn can be life-threatening. Herpes, if you pick up herpes when you're four and five, which is where most people pick it up, it's not life-threatening, okay? Um, somebody asked, what's the sterilization process for these cases? Because you don't want to throw your instruments away, but I wouldn't want it that in my mouth after patients like these, even if it was cleaned. Actually, we do something called, um, there's various um, disinfecting and sterilization procedures. Sterilization actually means killing all organisms. And that's what we do to our instruments that we use. So the metal instruments that a dentist uses have been clean, pre-cleaned, Okay, they've been wiped off. Then they've been put in an ultrasonic bath that uses ultrasonic energy and vibration in a cleanser to help get stuff off. Then they're rinsed. Then they're put in these special autoclave bags and put in a machine that's called an autoclave and they're treated with steam sterilization under pressure. And if you remember the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, if you keep the volume the same, and increase the pressure, you can get the temperature to increase. The other side of the equation, the NRT, T is for temperature. And that, because steam, steam is 212 degrees or Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, but by putting it under pressure, you can actually even get it higher and it kills all organisms. In fact, dentists have to do a biologic indicator every time they use their autoclave. They have a, a bacteria that's hard to kill that they actually have to get checked every time they run the autoclave. So not only do we have these high pressure steam sterilization, we have to monitor that it works with every load we use. So um, super safe to be at a dentist as long as your dentist isn't some crack that isn't following what our standard protocols are. And every now and then you'll see a news report of some dentist that didn't sterilize their instruments, but that's like very rare. It's, I mean, you'd have to be a crazy person not to follow the protocol. So, you know, 99.9999% of dentists follow the established protocols. And, but once in the blue moon, there's somebody that's just crazy out there and in any profession. <laughs> um, so those, those instruments are, are very, very, very safe. We also use wipes for things that don't go in an autoclave, like a chair. Between every patient, we use an, an um, EPA, an Environmental Protection Agency rated um, hospital grade disinfectant, and we wipe all that down following the right protocols. So dentist office, offices are actually very, very safe. And I mean, same thing with other medical providers. I'm with you. I, uh, and, and I tell you, we tell our patients and we tell, we tell our students this too, you know, your patients are watching you. Just like when you go to, um, just like when you go to Subway, you watch them make your sandwich and watch everything they do. Yeah, and if they like touched their nose with that glove and then went back to your sandwich, you'd be like, time out, throw that thing away. I want a new sandwich. 
Um, the same thing with, with consumers. As a consumer, you should be making sure that when you go to any healthcare provider, things look right. Um, that they're washing their hands, that, that, that they're using gloves, they're wearing masks, they're following protocols. And, and I tell you right now with COVID, it's, it's totally legit to call your healthcare provider and say, hey, tell me about your, 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 your um, infection control procedures. I mean, you wanna be an con informed consumer. For COVID, our, our state dental board here in Alabama, and every state's a little different, has come up with some very strict protocols that are different. You know, like you have to meet the patient at their car and take their temperature before you let them in the building. I mean, that's not, we didn't do that before we just opened up. I mean, you went back in February, you just came into the dentist. We didn't take their temperature. So we were adding extra protocols to make sure we're keeping people safe. And that's just one of many. So let's take a step back and think about pathology. Because we think about pathology, right? Ology, study of, path like diseases, right? But it really goes back to the Greek. It really has to do with ethos, pathos, logos, um, persuasion. So pathos really means emotion, logos, um, logic. So it really more technically means the study of emotion or the study of suffering. But we think about it as a study of disease. So pathology is a branch of medicine that determines the nature and causes of disease. And we look at structural and functional changes and many pathologists spend the, spend the majority of their time looking under the microscope, but that's not necessarily all pathologists do. I'm very clinical, I'm a clinical pathologist. I see patients. Um, I'm gonna throw a, 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 just a patient case out at you. So do any of you know what this kid has, this young man has? He has something called Down syndrome also known as trisomy 21. We can tell that from looking at somebody because he has this genetic defect that caused trisomy of the 21st chromosome that actually caused physical changes in the body at a cellular level, but even at a macro level. We can look at somebody with Downs and Down syndrome and know they have Down syndrome just by looking at them. Flat facial profile, ears set a little down and a little more anterior. Um, thick neck, um, short status, okay? What do we know about this young man just from getting him from the waiting room? We, we go, you have Down syndrome. We know there's, there's probably mental issues, you know, um, mental acuity issues. So they may have a caregiver we have to work with. They may not be in a position where they can give consent themselves. We may have to work with a caregiver or a, or a guardian. Um, we know that they, their, their, their personality may be very emotional, very huggy, very um, friendly. Because Down syndrome patients, that's just kind of, a, kind of a, a common trait. We know physiologically, we have to worry about heart defects. About half of patients with Down syndrome are born with heart defects that would require us to give an antibiotic before we start dental care. Dentally, we know there's probably some tooth anomalies, higher risk of, of gum disease, lower risk of decay, um, tend to be mouth breathers because there's deficiency of the mid face. That's why they have this flat facial profile. So all sorts of things we know that we have to be worried about with this patient just for meeting them before we even start a medical history. So all these things we need to take in consideration before we ever get down into a patient's mouth. So pathology, if we kind of take the, the 30,000 foot view of pathology, it's really broken into two major um, subcategories, clinical pathology, which is all those laboratory things, the hospital lab people, right? Um, you know, who determines what type of blood you have, whether you're O negative or AB positive, it's, that's all managed by a pathologist, a clinical pathologist. If you have blood drawn and they do, um, you know, they, you do a, a complete blood count, that's clinical chemistry, that's all supervised by a pathologist. If you have a culture drawn, again, supervised by microbiology, that's supervised by a pathologist. Um, bone marrow to make sure this bone marrow can be transferred into this person or this kidney will work in this person. Again, all supervised by a pathologist. The other big arm of pathology is called anatomic pathology. So you think more of structures, right? Surgical pathology. Any tissue removed from the human body other than teeth should go to a pathologist to view under a microscope. 
So if you go into the hospital and get your appendix out, it goes to a pathologist to make sure that it's appendicitis and not cancer, okay? And autopsy pathology, um, that's where forensic pathology falls into. That is doing, you know, determining causes of death, okay? And hospitals want to do so many autopsies on patients because the, it's kind of quality control for them is, you know, why did this patient die? We need to know. We need to know our, our, you know, what may have happened in the hospital. Certainly, if you had surgery and died during surgery, the surgeon's going to want to know what went wrong. Um, why did the patient die so it doesn't happen again? So oral pathology is one of the subspecialties of surgical pathology. And, you know, medicine is, we all have our own language. And so surgical pathology, there's, there's different subspecialties, and that's where oral path fits. I'm a dentist, so I speak to dentists. You know, we have our own language. You know, you may have learned this week, B-U-C-C-A-O is not buccal, it's buckle. You know, um, you may know what direction that is now. Uh, we have our own language. Dermatopathologists, the, the skin docs have their own language. Um, GI path, hematopathology, pulmonary path, where there's all sorts of specialties, subspecialties. So oral pathology is especially of dentistry and pathology that deals with the nature, identification, and management of diseases affecting the head and neck. Okay. There are 10 recognized American Dental Association specialties. Pathology and endodontics being the most important two, and I say that because those are the two I have, but you know, there's surgery, orthodontics, pediatric dentistry, prosthodontics, think about a prosthetic, those are the ones that replace teeth, you know, crown experts, denture experts, dental public health, periodontics, gum experts, radiology, and then there's a brand new recognized specialty, it just got recognized here within the last couple months called dental anesthesia. So actually giving sedation in the dental office is a new recognized specialty because there are dentists that specialize in just doing that. So what does it take to do an oral, to be an oral pathologist, to be a specialist in oral pathology? Well, four years of college, four years of dental school, and then three more years after that. And then two years practicing before you can sit for the board. I like to say I'm the best looking oral pathologist in the state of Alabama. My kids like to say I'm the ugliest patho oral pathologist in the state of Alabama because I am the only oral pathologist in the state of Alabama. <laughs> um, so there's, uh, um, there's not a lot of us. We're, we're, there's, we, we, our numbers are low. Somebody asked about cosmetic dentistry added to that list. And I'm going to back up here and say, probably not. Why? Because general dentists work with cosmetic dentistry. Prosthodontics work with co cosmetic dentistry. Um, so many dentists work with that. It's probably not going to be its own specialty. Now, that being said, we have other boards. There is actually a, a organization of cosmetic medic dentist that just isn't a recognized AD especially. So you can do additional training in cosmetic dentistry and get some certifications in cosmetic dentistry that are above and beyond being a general dentist, but it's probably not going to be a separate ADA specialty. Um, just like forensic, there's a forensic dentistry that is not on this list, but there that has its own board certification and own thing. So there, there are some, some other recognitions that are outside of these 10. So great question. So what do we do as a pathologist? And I've just got a few more slides and then we'll have time for a couple questions. So we do clinical and microscopic diagnosis. Um, so if we see a patient clinically, and I, you know, I saw this guy clinically Christmas Eve, I'll never forget. And I go, he's got cancer. Now, are we going to cut off his face, do this horrific surgery based on my Looking at this, no, we're going to get a biopsy, and the biopsy comes to the pathologist. This is the, the mucosa. This is the lining of the mouth. And all this stuff down here, this more purple stuff that's within the pink, that's invasion. That's the cancer invading into the tissue. So we have our answer now that we get a biopsy. Surgeon's going to go in and do a surgery. And to orient you a little bit, um, you can see the ear to the left and the chin to the right. This, they took a block, a different patient. They took a block of tissue from the jaw and they did this, what's called a neck dissection. So if somebody's got cancer, they often will also cut out the neck, part of the neck. Why? They're looking for cancer that may have spread to lymph nodes. Okay, that's just part of the procedure. If you've got a, 
a, a cancer in your mouth, they're going to take some tissue from your neck to try to get any lymph nodes it may have spread to. Same thing if somebody had breast cancer, they often take this fatty tissue out of the kind of the armpit that is the first place it spreads to. Different patient, uh, but I want to warn you, after the surgeon does this, it also comes back to a pathologist. So this is the chin. This is the front of the, front of the mandible. Here's some teeth. This is where the jaw hinges on the, on the skull, so the condyle, and then this tissue they cut out of the neck. And a pathologist is going to go through and look at this tissue. In fact, it's even a little slicker than that. Um, any major hospital will have what's called a frozen section room. So if somebody gets, has surgery, they may send a piece of the tissue to the pathologist before they close the patient up from the surgery. So they may go, oh, here's where I think the tumor was the deepest. They send it to the pathologist, and the pathologist does a special technique called a frozen section, and they can tell the surgeon before, you know, they call them on the intercom and say, hey, there was tumor on that section you sent me, and the surgeon knows to cut a little deeper before they, they, they close the operation. So pretty slick things that they can do. Other things we see are, are lots of radiographic stuff. Now, this x-ray we're seeing is called a panoramic x-ray. And if you've ever been to the dentist and that machine went all the way around your head, you had one of these taken. And you can see there wasn't this area that looks different in the front. And a surgeon took it out. Okay. It's not bloody because it's been in formalin. It's been in this buffered formaldehyde solution. So it's, it's no longer looks bloody. Pathologist is going to cut it, describe it, take a piece of this to look under the microscope. And there you can see that cavity because this is a cyst. This is an epithelial lining that tells us that if you know what you're looking at, that this is a ridiculous cyst, something that's only seen in the jaws. And that's why we have this specialty of pathology in dentistry, because we have things in the jaws that we don't see anywhere else in the body. So we, we have this common language we need to talk at. We also diagnose and manage diseases. So this is a patient that has, I don't know if you see this big ulcer, they have something called aptus ulcerations or canker source. We have to rule out some systemic things, but once we determine it is not related to a systemic illness, then we train dentists to treat this um, with things that make it feel better and also things to make it heal faster. So lots of, lots of stuff you got to rule out. You got to make sure that what you're dealing with, and then you have to manage it appropriately. This is something that doesn't need a biopsy. So not everything we see, you go, we get a biopsy. A biopsy really doesn't show anything with this other than an ulcer. And then some pathologists also do forensic odontology. And I've been doing this for a number of years. So if you, you know, if you, the ways to identify an individual after death is personal observation. Well, you can't do that with a skeleton. Fingerprints, which you can't do with a skeleton. You could take DNA, but DNA is technique sensitive, takes a while, and labs are really booked up. So sometimes a DNA analysis may take weeks, if not months, to get the final answer versus if they think they know who the person is and they get, de get dental records, I can generally give them an answer the same day. I'm going to show you a gnarly one. So if you don't want to see a gnarly one, I want you to like turn away, okay? Um, here's kind of a gnarly one. And I'm going to orient you here a little bit. Shoulder, shoulder, chin, um, tongue maxilla, those are the upper teeth, and then the lower teeth are over here somewhere. This is somebody that um, jumped out of a building in downtown Birmingham and basically landed on their head. Um, had a long history of depression, um, treated, treated by uh, um, uh, mental health professionals for a number of years, had written a suicide note, um, left it in their apartment. The apartment was blocked from the inside, you know, the chain even. You know, you can't do that from the outside. It was only locked from the inside and went and jumped off the balcony. Now, they knew who this person was, but you still got to dot the I's and cross the T's and make sure, make sure, make sure. So this was one, again, they knew who the person was, got the dental records. We were able to make the identification the same day. And this is my oldest. He's now 25, just finished law school. Um, he says, wow, what cool stuff. So I wanted to make sure to leave at least a couple minutes for questions and we are there. And there's my email again. Don't, please, if you have any questions later, don't hesitate to email me. I even put my cell phone number on there. But this would be a great time if you have any questions. Feel free to use the chat function and we can spend a couple minutes if there's anything I can um, um, help you with.
So I got a question, what motivates your passion for dentistry? I'm a teacher. And if you can't tell, I love doing this. I wish I was in person with you, but webinar is the next best thing. So my passion, I've decided, and it's really taken me a while to realize it. This is what gets me jazzed up is um, I'm just kind of a natural teacher. This is what I like. Um, so I like learning things. Um, I like reading and then I like sharing that. So that's where I'm at. Um, somebody said, I'm the smart, I, mean, I, I love you. Whoever said I'm the smartest pathologist, that's not quite true, but I uh, do like this. Thank you. Um, you know, and you have to decide just in life what motivates you. And I, I won't say, I won't say when I'm a 20, was a 20 something, I was sure what motivated me. I thought I wanted to be a dentist, but I wasn't really sure I knew what that was. I went to dental school, but I always kind of wanted to be a teacher. And I was able to put together a career where I'm a dentist and a teacher, which is kind of the best of both worlds. Um, somebody asked, do patients usually admit drug usage when they are asked? Great question. So when we do a history on somebody, you know, we have to ask it in the right way. You know, you, you're, you're asking for all sorts of intimate things about somebody. So they may not. And there's some drugs that personally, I don't think really make too much of a difference for us dentally. But it is important to set the stage and say, you know, we're going to take this extensive medical history. I need to know what's going on so that we can um, properly treat you and nothing we do causes harm. Um, we are not obligated as dental professionals to report drug use. There, um, there are some things we are mandatory reporters like child abuse. If we think a child may be an abused, we have to report. I mean, we're mandatory reporters and if we don't report we can get in trouble and sometimes we're wrong when we report it it looks like child abuse and it's not and we're protected for that but drug use we don't have to report forward and and you know patients come to us as healthcare professionals because they tend to like us and and they trust us so that's part of just the the whole experience is to make sure you have adequate trust with your patient they can share things with you and knowing that knowing that that's a safe space um, huh, right. Thank you. Somebody said I smiled the whole time. Well, cause I like being with you guys. So now this is, this is, uh, this is great. I appreciate you. Like I said, the one thing missing here is that immediate feedback with questions and seeing your eyes, but, um, um, this is the next best thing. Um, I don't work in the clinic too much anymore. Um, just because I've, I'm also the associate Dean for academics at the dental school. And I teach a lot. It's just, it's so, and in fact, even though I've been on faculty for 26 years, I didn't start teaching pathology um, to our students until about six years ago. I was teaching other things and I was in the clinic a lot more, but then a need arose when we lost our pathologists and they said, you want to teach us? I was like, yeah, great. Would love to teach it. And so I've not actually been teaching this stuff that long. Um, and really like it. And that's been one of the cool things about being in academics is the career has not been the same year to year. It's changed a little bit over the years. You know, I, uh, that's, I'm also an endodontist and I'm, I'm, which they do root canals. I don't, I haven't done a root canal in several years now, um, but I am trained as an endodontist and I'm proud of that, but just my career has taken off where that's not part of what I'm doing today. Um, so thank you all trying to check on the time. We are at one till this is like perfect timing. And you guys saved me from a meeting I was supposed to have at three with a big group. So I appreciate y'all. And it really, I mean it, I mean it, I mean it. When I say, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to give help in any way I can, um, whether it's personal, professional, whatever. So I appreciate you. Thank you. And those are a couple of my kids when they were younger. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Name T. Before, before you leave, um, Dr. T, can we get a good picture of you in the group? Can you go back two slides? I like the other one. I like the other one. That one? Yes, that one. <laughs> Y'all smile. Dean, if you've ever seen Bean. <laughs> Darrell, I need your video on. Janaya. Ousley, video on. On three, two, one. Oh, hold it. Alcee's coming on three, two, and one. Got it. One more. Three, two, one. 
And let's try one more. Hold on, second page, three, two, and one. Got it. Third page of faces, videos on, three, two. They're coming on, three, two, and one. And I think that's everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks Have a good day. Nice. And, and Appreciate it. Be safe. Thank you. So everyone, we, we can reconvene tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock for Group B and then 11 o'clock for everybody. Right. It. Thanks so much for taking the time, Dr. Taylor Shalski. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. T. Great to see y'all. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Bye. Um, you said um, 10 and 11 for the times, but on the Zoom... Did I say 10? 10, 10.30 for... Okay, okay. Group B, I just wanted to make sure. 11.30. Sorry, I fast said it wrong. I've confused everyone now uh, for Magic City. Yeah, thank you. All right, yeah. Thanks. I'll ask the, the mentors to correct my, my mistake. All right, thanks. See you later.